Okay, awesome. so uh, good uh, afternoon, good uh, morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our first uh, Jordan Surgical Ground Rounds. Uh, uh, basically, uh, this is a series, inshallah, it's going to be a series. Would like, uh, first of all, to welcome uh, all of you guys. And we'll uh, start uh, since uh, with, uh, okay. So we're gonna start with the first case. <clears throat> Okay, so first of all, I would like to welcome you all again with us, uh, those who that, with us on Zoom, those with us on uh, Facebook. Okay, thank you very much for being here. Jordan, we have a strict uh, curfew and lockdown on Friday, so I think this is a good uh, idea to keep going on every Friday. But before that, would like to remember Shuhada uh, al-Wajib, uh, Shuhada al-Jaysh al our colleagues who just uh, passed away fighting this bad disease and the bad pandemic, they are Dr. Dua, Dr. Khalaf al Raqqad, uh, uh, Dr. Mufaq bin Baydin, and Dr. Adijna Min Asir Sayyid Al Aniya. So I would like for you all to al Fatiha uh, uh, and stop one uh, minute uh, uh, silence for their soul and appreci in appreciation and in remembrance of their uh, fighting for this bad disease. Okay, so uh, March is the colorectal cancer awareness month. And uh, it's, uh, uh, that's why we have choose colorectal liver metastasis. It's a bad disease, but uh, we are winning in so many battles, but still we are losing some battles. So I think screening and early detection is the way to go. And I would recommend for anybody who is with us today on, uh, 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 on, the, on the Zoom to do its part in, in, in promoting screening and early detection for colorectal liver metastasis. This is again going to be a series every Friday regarding Ramadan. We'll see if, uh, if we are going to do it through Ramadan or not, but at least from now until we have a better solution for this, uh, for every lockdown every Friday, we'd like to continue with this series. Uh, Alhamdulillah, Dr. Samir's mother with us had uh, promised to be uh, accredited by the Jordan Medical Council. It's going to be an interactive case discussions. We have both local and international speakers going to be live on Facebook and then will be uh, uh, put on YouTube. Uh, next week, we're going, to we're going to talk about pancreas with both local and international speakers. If you have any cases and you would like to present, please feel free to contact me. I would like to remember, welcome our panels uh, today, uh, uh, Dr. Martez Qadan. Uh, he's a friend of mine. He's the Gabin Step Family Endowed Chair of Surgical Oncology at Mass General. Uh, thank you, Martez, for being uh, with us during this busy time in your clinic. Dr. Reem Turfe, she's a, a, a medical oncologist at King Hussein Cancer Center. Dr. Osama Buhlal, he's a, a consultant medical oncologist from Florida, United States. Uh, Salah Abbasi, he's a consultant medical oncologist in private sector in Jordan. And Dr. Samir Smadi, He's a friend uh, and he's the chair of surgery, he at King Hussein Medical Center and also he works at the King Hussein Medical City, King Hussein Cancer Center. Okay, so we're gonna start with our first case. Uh, uh, our first case is uh, uh, a patient with a 74 year old uh, female. She's complaining of, uh, one second, do I wanna zoom, yes. Uh, she's complaining. Uh, just one second, stop chair. And then back chair. Okay. I don't know why he's leaving. Okay. 74, uh, right upper quadrant pain in November 2019, ultrasound showed multiple liver masses. She went ahead saying? and had an ultrasound guided biopsy of this, of this liver masses, and the biopsy was metastatic adenocarcinoma. Uh, they went ahead and did colonoscopy for her and find a sigmoid tumor, uh, as you can see in the picture. And basically, uh, uh, her CA was 50 0. Uh, this is her uh, CT scan, as you can see in, 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 uh, in this video. Again, you see multiple large liver lesions involving most of the left liver lobe. 
multiple lesions in the right liver lobe, as you can see here, uh, including some lesions next to the right uh, posterior portal vein, and a sigmoid tumor, as you can see here with local lymph nodes. <clears throat> so these are the lymph nodes, and this is the sigmoid tumor. Also, she had a, a CT scan of the chest, again, <clears throat> confirmed. Uh, also, she has one uh, single liver lung mass, as you can see here in the video right there. Okay. So this is a sigmoid tumor with, uh, I did not start the webinar. Okay. So mm, we'll go back. <clears throat> So we just started the webinar again. Okay. So we have this uh, 74 year old female patient uh, with uh, liver and, uh, okay, with liver uh, and bilobar liver and lung metastasis. So what would you do for this case? Now the pull is, uh, uh, active, please. Uh, we have uh, 144 participants, 74 year old female patient with both liver and lung metastasis. What would you do for this patient? Can you please answer? People with us on Zoom. We'll go back again. This is a 74 year old female patient complained of right upper quadrant abdominal pain. Osama, Osama 47 or 74? 47. 47. 47. Yes, she's young. She had uh, uh, multiple liver masses, ultrasound uh, showed multiple liver masses, biopsy proven adenocarcinoma, so colonoscopy showed sigmoid tumor. And this is her uh, CT scan, as you can see here multiple bilobar liver metastasis with a sigmoid tumor uh, with local regional lymph nodes and a CT of the chest showing single lung lesions, as you can see in the video. So can you please answer? People with Zoom, can you please answer? They cannot submit their answer. Okay. Cannot, yeah. Okay. Saying they cannot submit the answer. Okay, let's do it one more time. Pulling, free lounge pool. Okay. Cancel just one second. Who can edit? Nash to edit. They can't submit the answer. Let's see why. Pulling, free lounge pool. Okay. How about now? Can you submit your answer now? Okay, they still that we still have a problem here. We cannot submit our answer. There are 10 questions in the poll. Okay. Oh, now people are answering. Just so, choose the <clears throat> Choose the answer and then submit it. Okay, the options are, sorry, one, one, one second. The option are, these are the options. Refer to surgery for primary section, refer for surgery for liver resection, refer for surgery for lung resection, palliative systemic chemotherapy, there is no role for surgery, systemic therapy, and then reassessments for possible surgery. These are the options. <clears throat> okay, so for some reason we have, okay, people are answering now, great. So please, uh, we're gonna open it for another 20 seconds. Uh, can you please answer? Okay, 
So uh, let's start with uh, our medical oncologist colleagues. So some people, most, most of the answers came as refer for surgery for primary resection. So what do you think, uh, uh, Reem, uh, about this uh, case? Young female, bilobal liver metastasis and lung metastasis with sigmoid tumor. Would you, would you refer her for surgery or would you go for uh, 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 systemic treatment? Uh, well, definitely I would go for systemic treatment first. Um, uh, the first thing I would do, I would test her, uh, the biology of her tumor. Um, I would, uh, as, um, as any, any center, uh, each, uh, each patient should be, uh, should be presented in a multidisciplinary team and, uh, should be presented uh, to a surgeon in the beginning of the treatment. So a surgeon should be uh, on the case from the beginning, but for this case, I would uh, definitely start with the systemic treatment and then reassess. Some patients would uh, develop good response. And then later on after uh, the assessment depends on their response, I would uh, uh, go with the surgery if the patient uh, became resectable, but definitely not now. I would not go for surgery uh, upfront. Okay, Osama, uh, do you believe this patient with this extensive disease should be uh, uh, seen by a surgeon at the beginning of the case or maybe after you try some sort of systemic treatment and then basically uh, 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 you decide whether to refer her to surgery or not? Uh, the case or maybe after you try some sort of systemic treatment and then basically... Uh, uh, uh... Okay, Osama, Osama, we cannot hear you. Okay, Salah. Can you hear me? Yes, Osama. Yes, I will. I think the patient has potential. As uh, Reem said, we have to define the biology first. If she's BRAF positive, if she has bad prognostic features, I will not push hard. I will favor systemic at the beginning, but I would involve the surgery from the get-go to be part of the team. Great. Okay, so basically uh, you think with the young age, we still have to test biology and basically we should try systemic treatment and then reassess for possible surgery down the road. Is this clear? Okay, so next thing is I'm sure our friends who, uh, who, who's oncologists would like to know more about her biology. This is what we have in terms of Keras uh, mutation. This is the report that we have. It's 1% mutation in a background of a wild type DNA. So the question is what kind of chemotherapy would like to choose. Fullpox plus anti-VEGF based on this tumor, Fullpox plus anti-EGFR, Fulfiri uh, plus anti-VEGF, Fulfiri plus anti-EGFR, Fulfirinox or Fulpixiri plus uh, anti-VEGF or anti-VEGFR. And we're gonna start the poll again. And <clears throat> okay, so this is another poll. Okay, so please, people uh, who's with us on Zoom, what kind of regimen would like to choose uh, in this patient? Young female, Keras, 1% mutation uh, uh, in the background of a wild type. And basically we choose to go with systemic treatment. <clears throat> Can you please start answering on Zoom? Sama, she has a mutation. Huh? It has 1% mutation in a background of, of uh, uh, this is exactly how we get the answer. 1% mutation in a background of a wild type. Did the lab comment on the significance of the 1%? Uh, good question. Reem, can you, uh, can you help us answering this uh, 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 question? Did the lab comment? On the significance of this one percent mutation in the background. Well, uh, any 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 mutation is a mutation. Uh, and Kara. Yeah, yeah. My question, like the allelic per, the ratio, sometimes make like each lab has a cut limit of allelic uh, ratio to whether uh, it's positive mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. Can you can you put it back, uh, Osama? Okay. So again, this is the pathology. Uh, the uh, one percent mutation in a background of white type DNA. That's exactly how we get the report from the uh, uh, lab. 
which is the King Hussein Cancer Center lab. Uh, Osama, if you look at the, at the result, uh, just a few, uh, it, it says here that KRAS mutation is positive for positive. any mutation. The detection limit of their test is 1% in a background of wild DNA. So this test can detect a mutation, up to 1%. which up to 1% of the cells, if 1% of your cells have the mutation, this test can detect it. So it is a mutated KRAS. Mutated, yes. Yes, it's this mutated. is a mutated KRAS, yes. So positive, considered positive. That's what I'm yes. trying to say. Yes, yes. yes. Positive. true, yes. Okay, so basically, uh, uh, can you uh, read me why the people are, uh, so again, people are answering. So please, people on Zoom, go ahead and answer. Uh, we have around 200 participants on Zoom. would like to uh, hear from all of you, if possible. Uh, if you wanna, uh, if you are with us on Zoom, I would like to make a comment, uh, raise your hand and would love uh, to accommodate most of you. Okay, so we're gonna end the poll. So most people had answered between A and B. <clears throat> so Reem, uh, sorry, uh, let's go with uh, Usama. Usama Bohlal, what, what kind of uh, uh, young female, bilobar liver metastasis, lung metastasis, Keras mutated, uh, what kind of uh, regimen you would like to choose for her? I will use, uh, if we have potential surgery and uh, we, we can make it resectable, I will go with the nuclear option, which is Fulfixiri. It has the best data in terms of initial response. And then I will de-escalate if the patient does not tolerate. A lot of them at this age tolerate it really well. So that gives you a 67% chance of response and decent response. And that's what I want in this lady. now. To add bevacizumab, if I'm anticipating surgery or bleeding, or if the tumor by colonoscopy looks weird and a bleeder, I would wait on that. I want in this lady now to add bevacizumab. Good. Sorry. Osama? Okay. Did you hear me in the first comment? Yes, we did. We did. Uh, Salah, uh, what do you think using Fulfuxiri in, in young patients to achieve the best response as an upfront, upfront treatment? Uh, yes, Usama. I think, uh, um, I think uh, choosing any chemotherapy from these options is right. There is no right and wrong. Uh, you can use Fulfox, Fulfiri, or Fulfurinox. Fulfurinox associated with the higher response rate. And if you're considering a patient for response, because you're going to go for surgery, Fulfurinox is a good option. Uh, but you have, as Osama said, I agree totally with him. She's a young patient. And although from the initial approach with her multiple metastases in the liver and in the lung, I think my, uh, my approach will be palliative. And if she responds, then I will rethink about surgery. Uh, not every patient with such a CT scan will respond very well to go for surgery. You don't assume these patients to go for surgery usually. She has bilateral metastatic liver disease. So uh, if you are going to go with Fulfurinox and your aim is response to go for surgery, you have to be careful on the uh, uh, toxicity on the liver because you have multiple liver lesions. And if you're going to resect multiple sites of the liver, liver toxicity with iron tican and exalblatin will be high. Uh, so if you are going to go with Felfornex, you have to reassess, I think, with maximum of three or four cycles. You shouldn't give your patients more than four cycles before assess for surgery. If you have good response, if you, if you go with Felfornex and you achieve good response with four cycles, is great. But you cannot give like 12 cycles of Felfornex and then go for surgery. I think the toxicity is high. Um, but for me, I would probably choose Folfox and anti-VGF first, or Folfiri and anti-VGF A or C, and see how her response is. Uh, because patients who have response, usually they will get... Uh, this patient is not potentially resectable from the beginning. She has large bilateral liver lesions, a lung lesion. So if any miracle happen and she has excellent response, I will go for surgery. But she's not potentially resectable. Okay. Uh, 
بالذات تاني ليش احنا ما نعطيناش الانتي بي بي جي اف ار لانه هذا لازم يعرفوا ليش احنا كيراس 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 ميوتنت وبالتالي ما بيزبط تعطي الانتي جي اف ار وعاده الفيرست لاين از فول فوكس لكن هذه المريضه لانها شي از يونج وكان ويستاند الفول فيرونكس سو ويل جو فور اجريسيف مانجمنت وذ فول فيرونكس ليس بفل ثيري او ليس بفل فوكس بس لوحده علشان هيك كان الدكتور الدكتور صلاح كان رايه مثلا بس فل فوكس لوحدها او فل ثيري بدون اي شيء لانه از ابيليتيف تريتمنت لكن ذيس بيشنت از يونج ذات واي وي ويل اد فور فل فوكس ويل اد مور اند ذات وي ويل جو فور فل فوكس سو مش الشباب يعرفوا شو شو اللي قاعدين احنا بنحكي عنه انه ليش مش فل فوكس اللي هو الفيرست لاين او مش فل ثيري لوحده ليش فل فل فوكس لانه ذيس از يونج And she may withstand the aggressive management of this disease. Why did she not have anti-EGFR? Because this is mutant care. Okay. So, comment when we say resectable and unresectable, we have a difference between oncologic outcomes and technical resectability. That's a different story. When we are not dreamers, we're not naive. This patient is got, is the chance of that being cured by surgery is extremely low. That's However, talk, we're talking about long-term control of disease. The surgery, even big resections can be palliative, get you more mileage on liver functions because in people like that, the liver will fail them the most. And then if we leave these metastases without local regional therapy, even if we're talking about palliative intent, that will affect their life uh, style. Okay. So we're gonna proceed. It looks like we have a problem with the polls that has been created. Uh, patient received three cycles of full Fox plus anti-VGF uh, since she's keras mutated. And you can see uh, her lung lesion had responded very well. It's now much smaller. And her liver lesions also had responded very well as you can see here. Again, this is, uh, uh, good response after three cycles of Pulfox plus Bevacizumab with significant response also in the primary tumor. So uh, Dr. Mu'taz, uh, what do you think about this response? Uh, basically in the liver, in the lung, as well as in the primary after only three cycles. So first of all, let me say thank you very much for having me. It's a privilege for me to be involved with my colleagues uh, in my home country of Jordan. So thank you very much. Second of all, let me say a couple of things. I just want to second what other people have said. I think a surgeon should be involved from the beginning. We actually published a paper on that showing how important that is because if you don't do that for every case, then there will be the cases that are resectable that don't come to the surgeon. And so unfortunately to get everybody on board is you have to have the surgeon involved early for every case. Now, you know, there are a few things that concern me in this lady, obviously the KRS status and the fact that she has a lung metastasis. Those are the two things that change the outlook and the prognosis for this patient. Um, limited hepatic disease should be considered curative intent, even if initially unresectable by appearance. When you look at this scan, I think, first of all, it's great that she's having a response to the systemic chemotherapy. I agree with the choices of systemic chemotherapy. Uh, here at the Mass General at Harvard Medical School, we tend to use Fulfoxiri as our regimen to try and get the maximum response possible at age 47. You wanna do everything that you can. And I, I agree with the panel on everything that's been said, and this is consistent with what we do as well. Then the next thing I would say is given that she's had a good response, you have to start thinking about when you want to do surgery. So you don't wanna to do too much chemotherapy. In general, in my practice, I tend to do two months of chemo up front, and then four months on the back end if there's hepatic resection being contemplated or sometimes three and three for the total of six months. In a situation like this, I think technically uh, the liver is potentially resectable. I can see a strategy here maybe where you can consider a left trisegmentectomy and then an ablation of that lesion that's sitting in the posterior sector. The lung is easy to address. It's actually very easy to address the lung with an RFA, wedge resection, or SBRT. The problem is obviously tumor biology but she looks like she's actually having a very good response. So I would not be too worried about proceeding in this person, give them the best chance. I'd just like to make two additional points. In somebody with unresectable liver disease, that there are two other options that we should be thinking about more for the future. 
but one of them is currently something that we use is a hepatic arterial infusion pump with FUDR. Um, in the Michael D'Angelica series from Annals of Surgery in 2015, in patients with bilobar unresectable hepatic disease, median tumor number of 15, 50% 50 of patients came to resection eventually with hepatic arterial infusion pump. So there is a significant chance of conversion to resectability. But how this compares to modern systemic therapy, including full foxiri, is unknown. And then the second point that I would like to make is that transplant is now becoming an option that we are pursuing here. Our good friend, Karim Halazon, who's another Jordanian surgeon from Cornell and is doing a great job with this, is a transplant surgeon who's enrolling patients on a protocol now based on the Norwegian trials. And we have very selective criteria. The lung metastasis would be a problem in this setting. But just from an educational perspective, unresectable hepatic disease is amenable to transplantation. Thank you, thank you, Martez, for uh, giving us this heads up. Unfortunately, the uh, uh, the transarterial chemoembolization uh, or the, the infusion pump for transhepatic it's not available in Jordan. I've tried to bring it to Jordan when I was at King Hussein Cancer Center. I don't know where it is right now, but it's something that's not available. And liver transplant, it's again, according to the Norwegian trial, it's something promising, but it depends on the basically uh, uh, availability of the donors. We'll talk about it later as we go through the discussion through this case. So again, for our friends uh, with us here, after three cycles of chemo, excellent response, as you could see, both liver, lung, and primary has responded. What would you do right now? Refer her to... Uh, uh, basically for primary resection, lung resection, liver resection, continue chemotherapy, or change to second line chemotherapy. I'm gonna start the poll. Uh, and basically, uh, 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 basically, I hope, I know the poll is not only one question, but you can answer what's one question and then submit it. And I'm sure it will, that question one, you can just answer question one. Uh, and submit it. Uh, so basically we'll get some answer. We have 171. Uh, people with us on Zoom, and we have uh, multiple others on Facebook. So what do you do? Change to second line, uh, refer for primary, refer for lung, refer for liver, or continue chemotherapy? Okay. I'd like to get more votes. <clears throat> some people want to get to the liver, some people wanted to refer for primary, and some people want to refer for lung and some people would like also to continue chemotherapy. Okay, so we're gonna end the poll and share the results and stop sharing and then go to the next slide. So <clears throat> uh, the other question, if you wanna continue with uh, systemic chemotherapy for how long you would like to continue this therapy uh, for a total of six cycles, two to three months for a total of uh, 12 cycles up to six months until no more response, until disease progression until the surgeon says he can take it out or there is no rule for surgery at this time. So again, we're gonna start uh, the poll one more time. <clears throat> Please go ahead and answer. <clears throat> okay, so we're gonna in the poll, most people had answered until the surgeon says he can take it out. So the question is uh, uh, for you, Mu'taz, uh, as you could say, uh, basically, uh, uh, is this when you, when, you, when, you, when you see the patient up front and you say this patient potentially resectable if there is conversion, uh, you said only uh, this is six cycle is, is planned and programmed or you are involved all the time Every time the patient gets scanned, there's a phone call. Hey, can you look at this scans? What do you think? Or it's just a break around six cycles, and then we'll 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 we'll, we'll relook at it at, at it again. Very good question. Both to some extent, both the answers are correct. But I will tell you though, in my practice, I tend to make it a programmed, automatic six cycles, and then I review. I will tell you that if in six cycles the disease remains unresectable the chances are it will continue to be unresectable. And what I always tell our chief residents here when I'm teaching them this is that you have to know that the location will not change. The tumors will get smaller, but the distribution doesn't change. 
And so giving more chemotherapy may make it smaller, but if it's unresectable based on distribution, that's not going to change. Okay. This becomes the important thing to understand. But Dr. Sami, yeah. at King Hussein Medical City, how, how you guys approach such young patient, bilobar lung with upfront treatment of chemo? Did they get lost with the oncologist or sometimes there is really refer back after a few cycles to, to reassess responses? Actually, what we are doing, we are sending the patient for three cycles. Then uh, every six to eight weeks, we will just see the CT scan. For this patient in particular, after three cycles, after this uh, CT scan, I would go for, first of all, for MRI to see if the, the same uh, findings or not. If the same findings, uh, actually, this patient is resectable with little bit just modification with the trisegmentectomy from the left, left trisegmentectomy plus removal of there are two regions on the right and there are one only single legion between six and seven, most I would go for ablation for this uh, legion. Although it's, it's really near uh, a vein and most probably it will need microwave, not RFA, but this patient at this sitting, if the MRI proof is the same, I would go for resection with, if I saw that uh, interrupt the, the uh, volumetry of the volume of the right loop, remnant right loop or remnant posterior sector of the right loop is not enough, I may go, if I do see, for example, uh, CT volumetry, I, I may go for uh, two-stage surgery. That means, uh, uh, but in this sitting, in this patient with only three cycles, still the liver is healthy. I would go for trisegmentectomy and removal of the right, two right loop regions with microbe ablation on the uh, uh, segment six, seven, between segments. So this is tricky. There, there, there were just only single legion, which is tricky and need, need ablation. Apart from that, we can resect all the uh, tumors in this area. Thank you. So again, uh, this is what Dr. Martaz and Dr. Samir had uh, uh, touched on uh, for our oncology uh, uh, friends. We're looking for the best response, not the maximal response. So every two months, every six to two months, uh, uh, sorry, every uh, six weeks or every two months, uh, there should be some sort of reassessment by a surgeon to assess for possible resection because we're not looking for the maximal response, we're looking for the best response to make it resectable. And then something to keep, to keep, keep in mind uh, from a hepatobiliary surgeon standpoint is the chemotherapy induced liver toxicity that has been linked to some sort of both increased mortality and morbidity if it's increased uh, uh, more than uh, basically uh, 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 six months of uh, treatment. Okay. And again, the, the, the timing with it, when you use bevacizumab, this is very important. The last cycle, most of the time, you should not have bevacizumab because we, we like to have it at least five to six weeks before uh, uh, surgery uh, to stop. So this patient actually ended up having 12 cycles, uh, not only three cycles. It's mainly related to the pandemic. It was in the peak of the pandemic. And this is her repeat CT scan after 12 cycles, as you can see here. This is her uh, uh, response. You can see some now liver changes but you can see the lesions are much smaller. We have still have a lesion near next to the, one of a major branch of the middle hepatic vein right here. And basically uh, uh, you can see some lesions in the right. There are peripheral lesions, as you can see here. And the lesion that was in the right posterior portal vein had disappeared uh, on CT scan uh, as well as on PET scan. And then other uh, uh, small lesions at the peripheral of uh, the uh, uh, right posterior sector, as you can see here. Uh, this is the lung uh, lesion. It's almost had completely disappeared. You cannot see it anymore. Just because you know it is there, you just try to find uh, a lesion uh, uh, at the side that's right there. So it's barely seen. And none of these things uh, actually led up on PET scan. So uh, what would you do now? Uh, continue uh, chemotherapy and or consider surgical resection. Uh, let's uh, create the pull and see if people would uh, uh, help us uh, with the answers here. <clears throat> what do you think? Continue chemotherapy or consider surgical resection in this patient? Please answer. We have a 170 participants on Zoom and we have multiple people on Facebook. Please answer. Uh, Usama, you said the uh, herpet scan, uh, even the liver lesion did not let up? 
Yeah, everything was basically uh, clear. No FDG activity, no metabolic activity in none of these lesions. Okay, so most people had uh, considered surgical resection. That's great. And basically, uh, and we have discussed about the resectability again. Uh, for me, uh, uh, again, this is the scan from uh, uh, June after 12 cycles. You see, definitely the left lobe has to come out. We have this lesion in next to one of a major branch of the middle hepatic vein. Yes. And we have another lesion. Uh, this is a, a, in the right posterior sector right there. And we have another lesion that was in the right posterior portal vein. I'm going to show you the scan from uh, uh, March, where actually after three cycles, and the other principles that other people had uh, agreed on that we always plan our surgery based on the pre-chemotherapy uh, 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 basically scans. So this is very important to get a properly done CT scan uh, uh, for this patient. Okay. So in terms of surgical resection, how would you approach this disease? Liver first approach, primary first approach, synchronous liver and colon, stage hepatectomy with colon resection during one of these stages or lung first approach. We'll start uh, the poll again. Please answer. How would you approach this patient? Liver first, primary first, synchronous liver and colon at the same time or a staged hepatectomy? with colon resection, one of the stages or lung first approach. People with Zoom, uh, we have 164 uh, participants. Can you please answer the question one? <clears throat> okay, uh, Mortez. Why people are answering, uh, can you please tell us what, what is the approach that you guys do with this patient? Young, female, excellent performance, bilobar liver, excellent response with lung meds. How would you approach this patient? Well, I think one of the things that we learned the hard way is trying to do major lobe resections with colons is fine when it works, but very bad when it doesn't work. If you have a colonic leak, and you're relying on major liver regeneration, you can end up with a big problem. And those patients don't have much reserve to give, unfortunately. Um, we learned also from the Rob Martin paper that was published in JAX a long time ago, that was a retrospective review, that if you look at the complication rate from separating versus simultaneous, obviously simultaneous is better for the patient, but it's not always possible. The Mayo Clinic data would suggest that major lobes with major colonic resections defined as left-sided resections are not a good idea. So for me, a case like this, I would try and get the liver done first. This would be my approach. Okay, Samir. So I, I agree with Dr. Mohtaz because actually now I'm, I'm more concerned about the liver more than previously. Then although this, it seems to be every, for the audience that the liver is getting much better. For me, it's not getting much better because I have to remove the legions, although they are disappearing. And in this case, the patient had 12 cycles of chemotherapy. So I have to be very cautious when, when, when I'm going to have trisegmentectomy uh, and uh, removal of um, uh, some lesions in the right loop. With this chemotherapy and with, these, uh, with the toxic chemotherapy, I will be very cautious in doing anything apart from that. So I will go for liver first uh, and I, I will be more cautious than previously with the liver. Actually, everybody know that the, the, the uh, uh, residents should know that when we are doing uh, both liver and uh, um, colon, uh, the, it should be a little bit more optimal uh, um, um, position for the patient. That means for the patient, it's, it's definitely uh, much easier to do both together. But for the surgeon in this setting, I would not go for uh, combined. I would go for liver first. Okay. So again, uh, did some volumetry, her future liver remnant uh, with actually left lobectomy and multiple wedges and ablation on the right, not a trisegmentectomy, that's how I approach it myself, was around 30%. So my, my uh, basically uh, 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 the option was actually I went for an ALPS procedure. And basically this is what I've done, multiple wedges on the right, microwave ablation for deep lesion, the one in the left uh, posterior portal vein 
and the one in uh, next to the uh, major branch of the middle hepatic vein with microwave. And during the first stage, we did the sigmoid uh, colon resection. Mu'taz, uh, what do you think about the ALPS procedure and what is your experience with this intervention? Partial ALPS, it's not a, a, a complete ALPS. I mean, I think like any other therapy, it has its place. You know, it's just a question of selection of patients appropriately for it and whether you really need it or not. I can tell you that in the United States, we have not taken it up very much like the Europeans have. Uh, we believe that there are some problems in that. Number one, you know, most of the cases that need ALPS, you can actually get there with a two-stage hepatectomy. Uh, the degree of hypertrophy may be a little bit faster but the insult and the assault to the patient is not insignificant. And the morbidity from this is very high. But also the, the other thing that we've learned is something about cutting the liver and leaving it in place uh, that maybe results in these kind of additional humors that circulate around. And these people are more prone to developing additional lung metastases. So I think that our experience has been, um, I would say a little bit less uh, inclined in the in general. Now, we've done it here. We do it in our hospital. Uh, there are other centers that do it more liberally as well. The, the thing is, at the end of the day, you have to be able to find the segment or the sector of liver that is disease-free that you would like to leave behind. Um, I, I think that you could have gone away in this case without needing to do an ALPS procedure. I think that you have enough in the posterior sector of the right to address those two additional lesions with ablation without needing to go ALPS, but I, I think it's fine. Great, Samir, can you comment about that? I think that what I, I, when I was telling you that I will be very cautious in, in that patient, um, comparing to the previous one, when, when the patient was having three cycles only, that's what you did. You were very cautious, you were, you were very cautious for the, the, the effect of the chemotherapy on the patient. That's why you did so. And I think that nobody knows the, 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 right, the definite right way. Uh, we did a lot of ALPS actually, and we know we, we've I, I did you, some with you, Dr. Samad. I think that if you will be cautious, I think that you should go for abs. Not, but for me, with this volume of the liver, I would go for uh, um, surgery in one stage, not not uh, uh, abs. But for, if to be cautious, actually, abs has got a place here. Yes. Okay. So again, for the sake of time, we're gonna proceed. She, we did her first stage. She did very well. Now, this is the interesting, basically. The pathology was actually, there was complete clinic uh, pathological response. None of the liver lesions that we did, which is resection, had viable tumors. And even her primary actually had no tumor at all. And none of these lymph nodes uh, basically uh, has any tumor. So complete pathological response with treatment effect is seen in six lymph nodes. The question for uh, the panels here, would you uh, subject this patient based on this pathology for the second stage? Or you would have done say, well, this is a complete response, both primary and liver. Martez, what, what do you think? Well, the short answer is nobody knows. And, uh, you know, I, I would like the to- question. Yeah, so, and, and I would say the same with the PET scan, by the way, just to be very clear, if the scan shows that there's no FDG avidity, we don't have any data to support not going in. So this would be dangerous to do, and I think we have to be careful. In a situation like this, where the primary is also pathologically complete and the liver, I think you could make an argument for serial observation and surveillance. Uh, in general though, uh, this is an unusual situation, I'd say. Okay, so this is her CT scan after the first stage with excellent, uh, basically, uh, hypertrophy. Uh, this is the site of wedge resection. This is the site of ablation next to the middle hepatic vein, as you can see here. Still, we have uh, 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 tumors in the left, as you can see here. Again, these are were not metabolically active. This is the site of large microwave ablation. That, uh, uh, and then you see this is the site of microwave ablation next to the right portal vein, right here. This is the lesion that was here, and the left portal vein was uh, ligated. Uh, basically, so we went ahead and did her uh, second stage, and uh, we did a left hepatectomy, and uh, I did three wedge resection uh, for the lesion that I ablated. And we're having the second in the and we're having in the and then this is exactly what we got again. No viable tumors uh, uh, were seen in the liver. And basically, all these necrotic tumors. Uh, the, the, the last question for this case, based on this excellent response, 
would you refer for thoracic surgery for lung resection? Reem, what do you think? I would not. I would not. I mean, she she proved that she had uh, an excellent uh, response and uh, she had uh, good uh, tumor that responded to your uh, to the chemotherapy. So I would not. I would just observe. Uh, I agree with uh, Reem. I think uh, she is in complete remission, and you prove that by pathology and by PET scan. So there is high correspondence between your PET scan and your pathology on this specific patient. And in this case, I would trust the PET scan that she's in remission. I wouldn't subject her to thoracic surgery. Probably I would just continue systemic therapy for another four or six cycles ad adjuvant therapy. Again, yeah, uh, there's- yeah, I, I was, uh, this was, I was going to say that there is no uh, um, specific criteria here that we can follow um, if you are going to give more chemotherapy or not. But uh, uh, I think that the main issue is not to do any further surgery as long as she's in complete remission by PET scan. Yes. Yes. Actually, I just have seen just the, the very nice hypertrophy of the right loop. So I think that uh, weighing the risk benefit to remove the left loop was a, a wise thing because just to, to, to leave it as such and to have a flare up. So we have good right uh, loop hypertrophy. So I think that it was wise to remove the left loop. Okay, um, it says, how often do you see a complete response in the primary tumor in the colon? Um, so, you know, in the Nordlinger data from the aortic study that was multi-institutional, the complete pathologic response recorded in that study in upfront resectable with four liver metastases was 3%. I will tell you that in my personal experience, when we have complete responses in the liver, that the, usually the primary is not complete respond there as well at the same time. I feel like there is actually discrepancy between the response in the primary and the response in the liver. And for some reason, the response in the primary, I think, tends to be a little bit lower. And in fact, we just saw a patient today who had a response in the liver and progression in the primary in the colon with new onset of obstruction. So overall, I would say if 3% is the overall pathologic complete response, I think for both sides is unusual, I would say. Okay. Uh, uh, Salah, uh, sorry, um, uh, can I comment from medical oncology perspective? Uh, I kind of... Uh, the being in remission, even pathologic or metabolic, is not mean, does not mean cure. So I would add to lung stereotactic uh, surgery. We don't know what's in that legion because the PET scan can detect up to half centimeter. So if there is a tumor, it might come back. If we uh, here, uh, when we do anything, we need to have to define our goal. What are we trying to achieve? In this case, obviously, we are fantasizing cure. Okay, it's not like a real chance, but there is one. If we're fantasizing that we should complete your mission, why would you address the liver with surgery and leave the lung? So I would do stereotactic and even questionable wedge resection. Great. Uh, Dr. Samir, uh, any comment? For, for me, of course, I'm not an oncologist, but for the lung, maybe I will wait. But for the, what we've done well, for the uh, left hepatectomy, I think it was wise because we don't know what will happen. We, we have to have this chance for removal of the left loop while it's, it's, it's still small. And we have good hypertrophy actually with the right loop. This is right. But Osama, Osama uh, my understanding that the, the lung lesion was completely resolved on the PET scan, on CT scan. There is no lesion to resect. So what are we going to resect? I agree with totally with Osama. If there is any residual tumor or residual lesion on a CT scan or PET scan, I would resect. But uh, with this complete pathological response uh, and there's no lesion to resect, I don't think I would uh, subject my patient to thoracic surgery. As you said, our aim is a cure with a systemic disease. So you have to be also careful if your patient uh, went on any side effects or complication from her lung surgery uh, without um, big benefit, let's say, from surgery because you don't have any lesion, I think uh, it's not justified. Uh, I, I wouldn't do it if she has complete uh, this, this, this CT scan, complete resolution on a CT scan. I wouldn't do it. 
you still can irradiate stereotactic body cell, like radio surgery at the site of original tumor. But to irradiate very... what, uh, Osama? She has no lesion to irradiate. To you irradiate what? I mean, there is nothing in the. In you the cannot system. see it. How can you irradiate you can the. Argue, you can argue, and basically, this is how we look at it. You can argue there might be a small scar at the site of the lesion right there. So it's like it's less than one oh. millimeter. This is just be us knowing where it was exactly. So this is this is exactly, I think, what maybe was- And they can do planning. They can do planning based, based on the previous or location of the tumor. Yeah. And now, uh, this is the, basically, this is patient uh, had her CT, uh, CT scan six months after treatment. And basically, it's, she's still uh, nothing in the lung. And her CA is, is fine. And this is her- uh, this she, She's proving herself. Yeah, so far, so far. Anyway, uh, do we have time for more cases or take some questions? Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, one person, one option is to consider the, uh, uh, circulating tumor DNA to decide on further therapies. What do you think about circulating tumor? This is from Hamad Ifeshat from Johns Hopkins. What do you think about using uh, circulating tumor DNA to decide further therapies, uh, Reem? I don't think it has any, I mean, uh, maybe in the future, but not now. I mean, uh, uh, it gave us uh, an idea about the prognosis of the patient, but not to direct our treatment. Mu'taz, do you guys use this in mass general to, to guide uh, treatment, further treatment in such cases? Yeah, can I just say, I know Muhammad, I actually worked with him at Memorial Sloan Kettering. He was a research fellow there and is a great guy and another Jordanian superstar as well. And, you guys are uh, superstars. Yeah. So we, we are using now the ctDNA panels a little bit more to try and define differences between high risk stage two and low risk stage threes for adjuvant therapies mostly. Um, so I think for that- prognosis. Yeah, we, we should definitely be trying to push as hard as possible to use these more and more. I think very good question. Osama Abu Hilal, do you use this in your practice? I mean, I'm like our practice is like we are here in a data free environment. I will not exhaust the system with unnecessary testing. What I will do if the patient progressed, then I will re uh, evaluate the biology. But this is a fresh tumor. We are in the middle of treatment or towards the end. Doing circulating now may not do any benefit. Uh uh, Dr. Isa, he's a, our radiation oncologist at King Hussein Cancer Center. He, regarding your question, Osama, about using SPRT, he, his, his comment, there is no measurable disease in the lung to consider SPRT. Thank you, Isa, for being with us. Uh, again, uh, would you consider local regional therapy for the liver from the, the get-go? Uh, Mu'taz, how, how much it will take from a system to really adopt this uh, hepatic artery infusion pumps. I tried it to, uh, to uh, I thought about it when I was at the King Hussein Cancer Center. I don't know if they're still interested or not, but again, with the Mark Angelico data, I think it's very promising, especially for young, not responding to systemic treatment as the uh, a case that we were discussing before. How, yeah. how much does it take to start such program? It's, it takes a lot. It's very resource intensive. You have to have buy-in from a multidisciplinary setting. You have to have the medical oncologist. You have to have the surgeon. You have to have people who can troubleshoot issues. You have to be able to deal with the biliary sclerosis. You need the radiologists who can track these. Starting any program is not easy. Now, I can tell you that the US experience, as you know, um, you know, the way that money is spent in our system is unfortunate. It's not very good because there's no careful control over resources and financing and things like that. But if you look at the experience from European countries and South American, this would be a better one to adopt than the US model. And if you look at some of the Argentinian surgeons, uh, Professor Santibanez and those people over there, they have done a great job with using portacasts that they implant in the abdomen and use those as their hepatic arterial infusion conduit. And there are ways to make this work in a more cost-effective and, uh, and uh, resource-mindful way um, so that you can do it in any setting that you want, basically. Um, but it's not, it's not just money. That's not my point. My point is it is a very resource and labor intensive process. And it takes a lot of time to get used to not doing the cases that go well. It's the cases that don't go well is where you need the most support. Okay. Samir, uh, would you be interested? I'm, I'm doing private practice. So I know I'm not really interested to 
to start such intensive program? How about the King Hussein Medical Center? Would they be interested in such thing? I'm sure our colleagues, our friends, Jordanian friends, uh, Mu'taz, Amir, Muhammad would be really uh, available to help if some if something is needed. Actually, actually, of course, uh, I have to have the the, the aid of, of the oncologists to do so. And I think that when I'm just looking at the the uh, implication of this particular um, infusion, I think that is marvelous in, in many cases. So. We have to think it over actually. We have to push to do this, these kind of therapies, uh, both in King's Medical Center and in, uh, and in Kongsing Cancer Center. So uh, the, we, we've, we have to start this actually, and we have to push uh, the oncologists to do so with, the, of course, our, our, our encouragement to do so. But I think that maybe in Kongsing Cancer Center, uh, things are more uh, logic to start with and uh, concerning their budget, of course, uh, and the system there com uh, comparing to King Sabah Medical Center. Well, sure, Doctor Reem. As in the King we are together at King Sabah Cancer Center, and we can do it. We can start it in the King Sabah Cancer Center more than even. I think. Medical. I think we should work on it. Great. Uh, uh, Somebody is asking uh, uh, Doctor Osama Diab is also a medical oncologist in in the United States. Uh, Salah, do you know what's her MSI status? I don't think we have checked her MSI status. This is a patient between me and Salah. We did not check it. Is that right? Uh, actually, Osama, we checked it. Uh, I checked it for every patient uh, with stage four up front, just to know my options later on. Uh, and she was uh, low MSI. She was not high MSI. So she's not candidate for immunotherapy. Uh, now, Osama, what is the role of immunotherapy? Now, with all these things, you just keep hearing about in an upfront as a first line treatment. Do you guys use it? Uh, is there any data about upfront immunotherapy for colorectal liver metastasis? The answer is yes. It's important. We, we did not hear yeah. you, Osama. We did not hear you. Now, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. So yes, MSI status is important from the get-go. We have compelling data that if you use immune therapy in, in those patients up front, in the first line, it doubles progression-free survival and response. So all, so it, it has a role. So I would do it from the beginning. We had some patients that we saw in um, these selective cases where we have, we're aiming at resectability. We treated some of them with immune therapy alone being older and they have amazing and durable responses with just immune therapy alone. Okay, we have uh, uh, somebody is uh, uh, wants to get involved and talk. Renee, <clears throat> can you, uh, you raise your hand? Do you have any question or comment? Okay. Well, okay. I was Renee Rousseau. Renee Rousseau out of the the finest uh, hepatobiliary surgeon in, in is the leading one with Vilgeti in France. <laughs> no, I don't think he's. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> anyway, uh, so again, uh, we're running uh, out of time. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, with for being with us for this one hour. Mu'taz, thanks for taking from your busy clinic time to be with us. Samir, Reem, Salah, Osama. Inshallah, this is a recurring event. Uh, anyone who would be interested to present and participate, feel free to uh, be with us. Uh, it's going to be every Friday at uh, basically 8 p.m. Uh, Samir will arrange for some CME through the Jordan Medical Council. And thank you very much uh, for being with us. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Osama. Any last thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thanks for thank everybody. You. Thank Marquez, you. Marquez, Osama, um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you again. Thank you very much. Nicely managed as well. Thanks, Marquez. Thank, thank you, Osama.